We're going to talk about coronavirus cases in Bear County. Metro Health hope to fully transition to a new program to track those cases by today, but it appears that's going to take a little bit longer. Metro Health says they are about 90 to 95 percent complete with that transition. They hope to be done tomorrow or Friday. We saw that process to move over into a new system impact the number of cases over the past few days. Today, 340 new COVID-19 cases were reported for a total of 41,614. Judge Nelson Wolf saying some of those cases were a backup from yesterday and light reporting from Sunday. Here's a look at how those number of new cases reported each day this week so far. We seem to have come back around the 300 mark. Metro Health today saying they expect to see similar numbers tomorrow, not a spike this week. Coming up, we're going to speak with Mayor Ron Nuremberg about these numbers and more in our live case at Q&A. The number of people in the hospital continues to decrease meantime, but there was a slight increase in people on ventilators and in the ICU. The number of staffed hospital beds available has dropped to 13%, and there were 14 more deaths reported today. That total now nearing 400 tonight. One of those deaths is SAISD kindergarten teacher Melissa Martinez, who taught at Rogers Academy. She had just completed her sixth year with the district. Martinez is at least the third educator to die from complications related to COVID-19. A reminder that school vaccinations are still needed this year, even if children are learning from home. That includes, college, that, that includes college students as well. The Texas Department of State Health Services announced the rules on school vaccinations remain in effect for the school year. The Metro Health Clinic will be open August 17th, but an appointment is needed. For those without insurance or a primary care doctor, you can head to ksat.com for a list of clinics providing free vaccinations. Metro health leaders say skipping vaccinations can lead to epidemics of diseases like measles. Judson ISD preparing for the start of the school year on August 18th, but a lag in the arrival of supplies could actually mean a delay. The 19th's Patty Santos reports the district is set to ask the board for a week postponement to ensure a smooth start to online learning. We need to have the devices uh, in house to be able to accommodate uh, our one to one initiative. Judson ISD has invested $4.5 million in technology to ensure that all 22,000 plus students have their own Chromebooks for virtual learning this fall. We have actually uh, more of these uh, devices on the way because we're obviously not the only school district that is vying for these devices to try to get to our students. Uh, so that they can do the virtual learning. And so um, there are some that are still on back order. But 15,000 books are in, but they're waiting on 5,000 more to arrive. Upgrades to the school's bandwidth are also taking place. When you get uh, that many, especially teachers, on one campus that are trying to do virtual instruction, you're going to need that bandwidth, or you're going to have a lot of glitches and uh, outages and so forth, crashes and so forth. The technology staff is meticulously ensuring those new Chromes have all the security updates to ensure students can log on. Those accessing the system on their personal devices will also need special passwords and clearance. All this takes time. As the district goes into uncharted territory this fall, they ask for flexibility. We just ask for uh, parents and uh, staff uh, just for their patience as we make sure that we try to make this uh, go as smoothly as we can and uh, have the instruction go uh, as efficient uh, as we can possibly make it. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. Legislation has stalled and it's impacting the census. It would have extended the deadline for the 2020 census, but without the legal measure, Filled collection for the nation's headcount will stop at the end of September instead of the end of October. Here in Bear County, 61% of residents have self-responded to the survey, either by mail, phone, or online. The, per the percentage is better than the state's average, but there's still work to be done. The census helps Bear County get its share of billions of dollars in annual federal funding for the next 10 years. That money helps with schools, roads, and emergency preparedness. The shortened deadline is worrying researchers who say the change will miss hard to count communities among minorities and immigrants and produce less trustworthy data. A boots on the ground project is set to begin here in our area next week. 
Pandemic protocol will be a part of the door-to-door -door effort to make sure everyone is counted. All staff members will have badges and other things such as briefcases, identifying them as legitimate census workers. If you have not participated, log on to 2020census.gov to fill out the survey online. An upcoming change in Metro Health's directive still hanging in the balance tonight. We were hoping to hear about its amended version during a virtual hall this evening, but that is now expected to be released later this week. Instead, tonight's meeting focused on a new indicator for a new school year. Metro Health hoping to prep parents and school officials before students are let back into the classroom. The school boards will be making the final decisions on reopenings, but as the night team Stephen Cavazos reports, this new tool will provide some guidance. Well, Steve, ACs, that new COVID-19 indicator is now listed on the city's dashboard. Now, the whole purpose of it is to gauge when it's safe to welcome students back into the classroom. Now, this is broken down by three colors, green, yellow, and red. Green means the risk is low, but social distancing and face coverings are still necessary. Yellow is a moderate risk, and face-to-face -face learning is possible, but in a limited capacity. And red shows the risk level is still high, meaning schools are not a safe place just yet. I don't think anybody who follows our data boards will be surprised that we are still in the red zone. Now, Metro Health is using three indicators to decide which level we are currently in. The positivity rate, which is how many people are testing positive. Now, that's currently at 15 percent. The goal is 5 percent. Doubling time, which means how long it takes a number of the number of cases that is to double. Right now, that's a 21, which is a good sign, and a two-week continuous decline in COVID-19 cases, which Dr. Junda Wu, medical director with Metro Health, says we haven't reached yet. Now, members of the Pre-K through 12 Coalition, which is made up of teachers, students, faculty, and community members, and health experts, contributed to tonight's discussion. Now, Metro Health is expected to release a new health directive sometime later this week. For now, reporting live, Stephen Cavas. So KSAT 12 News. Steve Eces. Thank you, Stephen. Street art meant to help amplify the 2020 civil rights movement was seen in downtown San Antonio today. Did you see it? Central San Antonio's initiative Art Everywhere is using the words of San Antonio Poet Laureate Andrea Vocab Sanderson in an installation around Travis Park. The words read jubilant and exuberant is the melanin for our of our skin from despair. We have risen. I hope that people understand that we've already arisen from, from a place of despair, even though we may be in a current state where we may be in, in shutdown or partially quarantined, partially out. We are fighting levels of systematic oppression and, and racism and things of that nature. Artists and volunteers joined Central San Antonio for the installation that happened overnight while most of us were asleep. And today we were one degree shy of the century mark. 99 for the high temperature and the average this time of year, of course, is 96. The record today, 104. That was set back in 2013. Right now, temperatures are in the 80s and even well into the 80s for a good portion of Bear County. 88 Holotus in Port SA, 85 Randolph and at the airport, the International Airport, we're 88 degrees. So early tomorrow morning, mid to upper 70s, we're thinking about 77 here in San Antonio. And you'll notice some clouds early in the day. Then we'll have vast sunshine and it's back up near the century mark. We'll be back to talk about lake levels and just how hot it's going to get coming right up. Thank you, Adam. Right now, two men missing, two separate searches underway. San Antonio police need your help in finding this man, 53-year-old Adrian Sepulveda. Officers say he disappeared under suspicious circumstances. He was last seen on the east side on Omaha Street back on the 4th of July. If you know where he is, call the San Antonio Police Department Missing Persons Unit 210-207. 7660. The Bear County Sheriff's Office also working a missing persons case. 38 year old Curtis Perry was last seen on July 27th on the city's north side near Jackson Keller and West Avenue. His Chevy Malibu was found. His remains are still missing tonight. Perry has tattoos of a pit bull and a cross on his chest, praying hands on his back. Anyone who may know where Perry is is asked to call the BCSO at 210-335. 6,000. Still ahead on the night beat, the race to a vaccine against COVID-19 has been a hot topic, but what about the history of vaccines? KSAT Explains is taking on the topic 
We'll have a preview coming up. And a San Antonio student's dreams of becoming a nurse cut short amid the pandemic. Her father grieving the loss of his daughter and honoring her memory coming up. And new video from Beirut. Drone video and satellite images giving a different view. Plus the latest in that investigation. Coming up next. Looking for a job has changed amid this pandemic with more aspects of the process moving online. Are there other ways to set yourself apart from other applicants on GMSA tips to making a great first impression so you can land your next job? Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want San Antonio's latest news and weather streaming free on KSAT TV. Investigators at the site of the blast in Beirut say they are focused on possible negligence in the storage of tons of highly explosive fertilizer in a waterfront warehouse. Lebanon's prime minister blames ammonium nitrate, which had been stored in a warehouse for six years, as the likely cause of the explosion. 135 people were killed, about 5,000 were injured. Beirut officials estimate the cost of the damage could be as much as $5 billion dollars and when you talk about that damage tonight a look before and after the blast satellite images obtained from CNN from Planet Lab show the area before the damage a look after shows a massive crater at the site of yesterday's explosion in Beirut's port the images show nearly every nearby building has either sustained significant damage or has been destroyed by that blast and you see that large water filled crater that's replaced the ground where the two port buildings once stood. Well, at least four people who were between 20 to 29 years old have died of COVID-19. 22-year-old Asanet Hernandez is one of them. Her goal is to become a nurse. The night team's Tiffany Huerta spoke to her father about the tragic and unexpected loss. On the way to the hospital, she told me she wanted to get married. Glenn Hernandez won't be able to see his daughter walk down the aisle. 22-year-old Asanet Hernandez passed away after battling COVID-19 for over a month. I took her to the hospital, and that was the last time I was able to, to uh, be with her uh, physically. Glenn says his daughter began feeling sick on June 20th. She developed a sore throat and a fever. She tested positive for COVID-19. Days later, she was taken to the hospital. On July 28th, Asanet called her father. I consider it a blessing to be able to have heard her voice one more time because not too many people get that, one, that last chance to say I love you. And uh, all of my family got to say that to her. Asanet died later that day. As soon as you became friends with her, she would love you with all her, her heart. Asanet graduated from Memorial High School and she was studying to become a nurse. Glenn misses the small things. When she wanted something, she would go, Daddy! This isn't the first time Glenn and his family experienced a loss. His wife died of cancer last year. Glenn hopes his daughter's story reaches at least one person. It amazes me to see that they think it's not real. Well, guess what? It's real. It touched my heart. It touched my home. Let's not be selfish and look out for one another. Glenn was also hospitalized for COVID-19 at the same time as his daughter. He has recovered. Asanet will be buried next to her mother this weekend. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. We've got a night beat update tonight. Remember three year old Miles Birdie? The Bernie toddler was awarded for his bravery, but his story may have helped others along the way. Back in June, we told you that Miles was puddle jumping along with his six year old sister and their dad when the fast moving waters swept Miles' sister away and down a drain. He ran home to tell his mother. His father tried to catch the little sister and did. Rescue crews arrived and they were eventually pulled to safety. Well, today the city of Bernie posted pictures of recently added barriers to help keep this from happening again. Street crews use material they had on hand to complete the project. The city says they are also working on an update to their code ordinances to require that future drainage projects have similar barriers put in place. All because of a three year old. That's awesome. That is. Let's take a live look outside with live cam. 88 degrees out there. Ooh, look at that moon. That's right. It's beautiful. Waning moon right yeah. now, but it still looks great. It does, especially from our uh, 
Sky 12 Chopper. So 88 degrees at the moment, it's warm, it's muggy outside, and it's our typical August pattern where it gets pretty repetitive. But I do want to point out, we will have the arrival of some African dust in the near future, so we'll touch on that. I want to start with lake levels, though. We haven't checked in for a few weeks. Take a look at these numbers for area lakes. Medina Lake, we did talk about it yesterday, 58% full. Uh, that's 20 feet below the conservation pool, and that's a change of 19 feet compared to last year. Then you look at Canyon Lake, 95% full, choke at 40% and Buchanan 96%. So overall, I mean, they're down compared to a year ago. You look at that far right column, uh, we could use some rainfall, not just for the lakes, but of course for our area drought as well. All right, so moving on. In terms of rainfall, well, not so lucky around here in South Texas today, but parts of Northeast Texas and down into Louisiana, even just north of Beaumont, Port Arthur area, they got some showers. There were some areas of rain, even yesterday off to the north of us. A little impulse of energy on the east side of the heat high, giving some areas of Texas some rain. We could all use it, well, with the exception of the valley. They're not in a drought right now, but most of us could use it and some people are actually getting it. The high was just a little too close to us today. It shoved that impulse too far to the east, and that's going to be the case here uh, for several more days. As for the tropics, not much out there. We have this little cluster of a few thunderstorms still, and they've been dying off this evening. There's only a 10% chance, according to the National Hurricane Center, of this turning into anything. It, odds are against it in terms of upper level winds and even some dry air around it. And there is some Saharan dust nearby that development. And Saharan dust, the African dust, usually inhibits the development of hurricanes and works against them in terms of any tropical system developing. No dust overhead right now, but look at this plume here near Puerto Rico and even the Caribbean. Okay, this orange area indicating the dust that's uh, detected by NASA satellites and then modeled here. Prevailing winds should bring it into the Gulf of Mexico by Saturday. Then on Sunday, we're expecting a little bit of that dust in the air. It doesn't look like a very thick plume of dust like what we had about a month ago. Nonetheless, you may notice that a little extra haze in the sky. And if you're extremely sensitive to it, you may be a little sniffly or notice it in your lungs. Otherwise, high temperatures today, for the most part, 90s. We did have a few locations at the Century Mark. Gonzales, 100. New Braunfels topped out at 102. And Del Rio, the hot spot at 104. Right now, we're 88 with a dew point of 62. It's a bit muggy out there. Of course, we feel the humidity. We're used to that this time of year. It's rare, rare that we get a real break from the humidity in August here in South Texas. But our time will come in the months ahead. So Kerrville, 82, 81 right now in Fredericksburg. Then you get up to 88 in Catula and still 93 right now in Del Rio. So tomorrow morning, widespread mid and upper 70s, 77 in San Antonio. You get into the hill country, yeah, a few degrees lower, about 73 for the morning low in Kerrville and Rock Springs. Then by the afternoon, we do this all over again. We're back up right near 100 degrees, probably just briefly touching it for an hour or so at about 4 or 5 p.m. And even locally, you see here closer in and around Bear County, New Braunfels about 101, along with Seguin, Lavernia 100, Timberwood Park 98, and Bernie will top out at 97 tomorrow. Other than some morning clouds, we'll have a lot of sunshine. Southeasterly breeze at 5 to 15, so our typical wind out of the southeast that every once in a while picks up. But with the heat and demands on our grid, it's going to be a case at power saving day. So CPS Energy is advising everybody to lower your energy use between 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. Their information points toward it being a big stress on our grid tomorrow. Uh, everything, especially combined with the heat that we have. And then you look ahead and we're still near 100 degrees by Saturday. Look at that little 10% chance. <laughs> little teeny tiny sliver. <laughs> <of hope. laughs> Don't bet on it. All right. Thank you so much, Adam. All right. So the Spurs lose two heartbreakers. Close games. But, Greg, they're still in the thick of this. They are because Memphis is also losing at the same time. When we come back, we'll show you how the Spurs hung tough against Denver today until that late in the fourth quarter. And also when we come back, the Runners getting ready for their season amid some very unusual times in the middle of a pandemic coming up.
had a great chance to move up in the Western Conference standings after the Memphis Grizzlies lost this afternoon. San Antonio taking on the Nuggets today. Denver got out to such a fast start. The head coach Greg Popovich pulled all of his starters off the floor, put the bench unit out, and instead, Nikola Jokic with feasting early, getting his own rebound and the putback. Nuggets up 16-4, to but the Spurs rally and turn it into a game. Rudy Gay knocks down the triple from the wing. That ties it up at 26 apiece. Spurs down 32-28 after one. Second quarter, San Antonio takes the lead. Patty Mills hits the elbow jumper. Spurs up 55, 53, and then with the clock winding down, Keldon Johnson drills with three from the corner. San Antonio leads 65-62 at the break. Spurs still in the driver's seat in the third quarter. DeMar DeRozan forces the steal. DeJounte Murray finishes with a lay-in on the other end, forcing the Nuggets timeout. San Antonio takes a 71-62 lead, but we're tied at 89 after three quarters, and Denver takes control midway through the fourth quarter. Michael Porter Jr. hits a triple. He finishes the game high 30. Denver wins 132-126, handing the Spurs their second loss in the NBA bubble. Patty Mills chooses to look at the long-term positives from the game. This is the perfect situation for, for the other guys, too, is to be able to, um, you know, be thrown in the fire, so to speak, to be able to um, learn on the fly. Um, so, so this is what, you know, these few weeks was always going to be about was development um, and, and meaningful things as well. Next up, early game for the Spurs on Friday. That will be at noon against Utah. Before this afternoon's game, the NBA and Players Association released a joint statement saying that of the 343 players tested it since July 29th inside the NBA bubble, zero are positive for the coronavirus. Pop was asked what has been the key to success for the league during this COVID-19 pandemic. The leadership of Adam Silver has done a magnificent job uh, of being visionaries uh, in the sense of looking at what unintended consequences may appear, but right down the line, since the day we got here, everything has been so efficient, uh, disciplined, done with ease. Now, Pop was extremely complimentary of how Mayor Ron Nirenberg and County Judge Nelson Wolf have handled the health issues here in San Antonio and Bear County, putting science before politics, but did not believe state leaders acted accordingly. It would have been a lot more wise to spend time worrying about how to open schools rather than how to open bars. Uh, so we opened the bars, et cetera, and now we're in this very difficult position with schools. The UTSA Roadrunners prepare to open their fall camp amid unprecedented conditions. Next. The UTSA Roadrunners open their fall camp this Friday, which would in itself be a challenge for a first time head coach in the FBS. But for Jeff Trailer, the difficulty factor has been increased due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Not only does he have to work his team around health and safety protocols, now they're forced to adjust their schedule after having their season open at LSU canceled. Home opener against Grambling State on the 19 called off, but Trailer isn't letting the uncertainty of the season affect his team's daily mindset. Seems like 2020 started 20 years ago, right? It's just the way this year has been. Uh, but we're so grateful. We remind our kids every day. We're not, we're not going to have that mindset. We're, we're going to be grateful for each day. We're not going to worry about tomorrow at all. And we're going we're to have a great day today. And our, our kids are really bought into that. Great attitude. Earlier, Athletic Director Lisa Campos told us the Roadrunners are committed to playing a 12-game schedule. So stay tuned. The War Horses are on the field and working out in Divine to get ready for their 2020 season. They are allowed to do so since they compete in District 15-4A Division II. Coach Paul Gomez will welcome back 14 starters, seven each on offense and defense, off a team that went undefeated in district last year and finished six and five overall, making it to the by district finals. On offense, the War Horses returned Justin Contreras, who had over 1,200 yards rushing, 18 touchdowns, along with All-State lineman John Schnauz, and defensive end Christian Gerlock with 10 and a half sacks and a defensive back Xavier Martinez with six interceptions. I'm very blessed to be out here with my brothers and all these other guys. You know, I really look forward to this year. Um, pandemic or not, you know, I think we're still going to do great things this year. Uh, this year we got a pretty good group. We got two All-State returners and we're hoping to do good. This is our last ride. It's going to be super fun. We're going to be as safe as possible and still let these boys play this game that teaches so many life lessons, man. So we're, we're, we're trying everything that we can as a staff just to keep everybody safe and, and, and confident in what we're doing.
Good to hear. The War Horses were scheduled to kick off their season against Sam Houston, but due to the UIL restrictions on 5A and 6A teams, that won't be possible. Instead, they will host Refurio, the defending state 2A champs, on Friday, August the 28th at 7.30. I know they're in 2A, but they're still the defending state champs, so that's a tough first game. Yeah. Working for Friday nights. We're ready. Yeah. Thank you, Greg. Got it. And coming up next, our live KSAT Q&A with San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg coming up. A breaking news, a San Antonio police officer arrested for sexual assault. Police say Officer Umberto Zuniga is an 18-year veteran with SAPD. He's assigned to Central Patrol. Police say they responded to a sexual assault on August 1st on the south side. The victim, a woman who was in a relationship with Zuniga, told police he had sex with her without her consent. She said she managed to stop him by grabbing a knife and then cutting his arm. He will be placed on administrative leave until further notice. Separating facts from the fear that are out there surrounding so many issues in our community and coronavirus COVID-19. Certainly some of the big ones. We're joined by San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg tonight. Thank you for staying up late with us, Mr. Mayor. Uh, right off the top, you know, we talked a, a little bit about this before, but when it, it seems like we're kind of getting lost in some of the numbers lately about, OK, we have state numbers and the way the state's changing it. And we have Metro Health numbers being counted double with so many conspiracy theories and fighting against social media and just trying to get the message through. How frustrating is this for you? You know, it's frustrating uh, because you, you want to be perfect and you want to be perfect from the start and all the way through to the end. Uh, the truth of the matter is, though, uh, there has been a number of changes of the state in terms of methodologies and how they count data. Uh, and that has caused some challenges with re reconciling that with the local data. The other issue is that there's been a small percentage, uh, around 1%, uh, that we're finding has been duplicate because people have taken multiple tests. And when the reporting agency reports them back, there's differences in the spelling or differences in contact information. This is number to about 600 cases or 600 uh, results out of over 40,000. So it's a very small percentage, but nonetheless, we've got to we've got to fix those things, uh, and we're doing that. I, I will say this: the speed of data that's being um, called and reported and uh, analyzed on a daily basis and on an hourly basis by the public health authorities is in some cases years ahead of what is normally taking place. In a non-pandemic year, some of this data, death data in particular, is called over a period of years, verified over a period of years. We're asking our public health authorities all across this country and certainly here locally to do that in 24-hour in increments. So, um, you know, we're, we're keeping up with it, uh, you know, very well. Some of it uh, obviously needs to get corrected now and then. Uh, and then we've got challenges between local and state. Uh, but but I think by and large, what is being represented is very accurate and people can trust it. And, you know, regardless of these discrepancies, whether it be in case counts or deaths, you, that's not necessarily the trend that you're looking at. I think you've said from the gate from the get go, hospitalizations carry much more meaning. Hospitalizations are real time data. And, you know, again, we, we want to we want to ensure that people don't get caught up necessarily in the specific number of cases each day, but look at the trends. And nowhere is there better uh, daily, uh, real-time trending data than in our hospitals. And so when we saw the cases accelerate in the month of June and then into July, we saw that number immediately in our hospitals and we saw ICUs up, we saw hospital uh, patient and admissions up, everything went up. Over the last few weeks, we've started to see that plateau and now, thankfully, we're starting to see it decline, not quickly, uh, but it's starting to decline. That's a good sign. It's telling us that, you know, our, our uh, public health guidance that's being adhered to from masking to physical distancing is working. We just need, we need to keep it up because we get to get that transmission down as low as possible for when things start to open up like schools and other activities. We get a lot of questions, obviously, uh, on our SAQ page uh, where people can ask questions that we can pass along. And that's one of the reasons we do this. Keith asks a question. He says, why is that people sit in line for hours to get a COVID test, then wait weeks for results, but 
NFL, NBA, MLB, and NHL players can get tested daily with results almost immediately? That's his question. And finally, why doesn't anyone in news seem to be asking these questions? <laughs> well, we just did, go. Keith. So, so <laughs> uh, how do you answer that question? Well, you know, I, I, not to speak for you and Isis, but uh, you have asked me that question before. And, and, and the trouble is, uh, here in the United States, we have been woefully behind as a nation in terms of testing. We're starting to get that sped up. But you have a myriad number of places that people are getting tested. First, you have uh, the public tests, and we have three sites. We have the two mobile pop-up sites, as well as Freeman Coliseum, where people can come and get free tests. And we want to make sure that we prioritize those for people who really have no other way, way of getting the test. They don't have a public, they don't have a, a healthcare provider, they don't have an insurance or something like that. Uh, we have had in, in a, a couple of months ago, and, and even a few weeks ago, we had had long waits for tests because we were simply overwhelmed with the number of people who were getting infected or who suspected they were infected. That's now kind of, that's moderated for sure. In addition, you've got 50 some odd private locations where people can get tests by going to their local medical provider or, you know, some other facility, in some cases, pharmacies and, and um, uh, other uh, urgent care clinics. They can get tests there as well. Some of those have weights because they're the very, the, they vary in terms of the supply. But when it comes down to the weight for testing results, that is our source of greatest frustration because quite simply labs, uh, and there are a lot of different labs where these different test results are getting sent to, have wide variability in terms of uh, processing, uh, in part because they've been overwhelmed throughout the country by how many tests are being sent. Uh, but also they all have different um, processes and methodologies and we get those testing results back in different intervals you get uh, your test result and then it's reported to the public health authority and then it's reported out as we say in in, in the the live briefings all of that is why i go back to what i said earlier which is that don't pay attention so much to the case count daily but look at that seven day rolling average look at the trending of the data and certainly look at the hospital trends to find out where we are as a community with regard to this pandemic. I want to ask you about the town hall that was held a little bit earlier today. We spoke about it at the top of the newscast, but you had an advisory panel speaking about school reopenings. Number one, what is the most common question that you're getting from parents or the most common concern? And then what can we expect later in this week regarding that new directive? Yeah, I haven't gotten a full briefing on, on how the uh, town hall went, other than it went very well. Um, you know, and, and uh, the comments I'm getting back are that our superintendents um, that were on the line have done an extraordinary job uh, in making sure that they're following the health guidance and protecting their community. So I want to thank, uh, I know Dr. Uh, Martinez and Dr. Woods were on the line. I think there may have been a couple others, Dr. Wu from the Public Health Authority. Uh, the most common question is, is it safe? And if it's not, when is it going to be safe? And I'm glad that that's the question being asked because that's the question that we should be concerned about. When is it safe to start going back to school in person? Before it's safe to go back in person, we want to uh, we want to enable distance learning as much as possible. But when it comes back comes to in school uh, in person attendance, what we want to do is make sure we get the transmission down as low as possible because the transmission level, the, the, the percentage of positive tests that are coming out, which is roughly 15% right now, indicates there is widespread transmission happening in our community, meaning that it's very likely that if you go out in the community, you're gonna come in contact and be exposed to someone who's infected. And then it grows from there. When there's so much transmission, it's very hard for us to use the, the methods to contain this virus, which are testing, tracing, and ultimately isolating people who are infected. So there's simply too many cases for that to be effective. So we got to get that transmission rate down as low as possible. And that positivity rate needs to get down to around 5% or less before we can feel safe opening schools. The way trends are, trends are going, we think that's going to be around after Labor Day. So if we keep up the good job that we're doing right now, hopefully we can get in-person schooling going safely uh, as quickly as possible. Where is this going over the next um, over the next few days, what is the public health director going to do? Uh, so you are going to see those metrics. I said uh, positivity rate being one of them. You're going to go see. You're going to see these metrics being published that links where we are with positivity rate, 
the rate of decline of cases, as well as how long it takes to double the number of cases in San Antonio, you're going to see those indicators point to when it will be safe to open schools. Uh, that's going to be published on a daily basis on our San Antonio COVID.COVID19.SanAntonio.gov website. So if you're a parent, a teacher, or anyone in the community, you can track where we are as a community with regard to this pandemic and how we're doing and how close we are to being able to safely reopen schools. Well, let's hope this trend continues, the promising trends that we've been seeing. San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg, again, thank you for your time. Thanks so much, y'all. We'll be right back. The debate over schools reopening rages on. Some students and teachers already testing positive. A viral photo from a Georgia school is only heightening concerns as students pack a hallway, many not wearing masks. But the president saying Tuesday he believes the coronavirus will just go away. Romina Puga has more. Tens of thousands of kids already back in school as President Trump keeps pushing for in-person classes, claiming the virus is on its way out. It's going away now. It'll go away. Like Things go away. Absolutely. It's uh, no question in my mind. It will go away. The president insisting children have stronger immune systems. Children are almost, and I would almost say definitely, but almost immune from this disease. But some returning students are already infected. A second grader in Georgia tested positive, sending all 20 students and a teacher home to quarantine. In California, third grader Nolan Wu is skeptical about going back to class. You're going to need, like, a face shield and a mask. And I'm sick of it. Many other kids are. And they might take it off. Meantime, the race for a vaccine continues, with Johnson & Johnson reaching a billion-dollar deal with the U.S. government to guarantee at least 100 million doses for Americans. So we're seeing some nice responses mm -hmm. in these plates. This is uh, without the vaccine, and with the vaccine, you can see that there's a lot more color. The color signifies antibody. The company is now in phase two of its trial, but says they'll catch up to the other six companies already in phase three human trials. And if everything goes well, they say we could see their vaccine by early next year. In Colorado, Romina Puga, ABC News. Let's take a live look outside with live cam right now. It's 88 degrees. Another hot day, Adam. Yeah, we're in our typical August weather pattern where it's pretty repetitive. One nice thing is that today there was no change in the aquifer level. It's still two tenths of a foot above the August average. And we're at stage one watering restrictions, of course. The 10 day average has to drop to 650 or less to get into stage two. And we're still a ways away from that. And of course, the rain earlier this week helped out and also boosted the mold. Mold high at 4,500 pigweed on the low end. Okay, here's something positive because of recent rainfall, at least in parts of Bear County, we don't have a 30 day rainfall deficit. Now there is a deficit as you get into the north side of town. You see Chavano Park about a quarter of an inch in a deficit there, but you look at the south side of San Antonio and even centrally downtown, there actually isn't a 30 day deficit. So compared to average, but we're in a drought off to the west of town. As for the state, 34% in drought, and that's about double what we had just three months ago. So a good chunk of the state really needs the rainfall. And we have had some across the state the past couple of days. Yesterday it was up north and even in the panhandle. Today it was closer to the Metroplex and East Texas and moving into Louisiana. For us, the upper level high was just too close. And the impulse of energy that caused those showers, well, it was pushed out of our area and kept out of here. It was blocked, kept away from us. Temperatures right now, you get into the 70s in Oklahoma and parts of Louisiana, even Amarillo at 77. Then in Midland, 90 degrees, 93 in Del Rio and in San Antonio. At the International Airport, we're 88 degrees. And that's actually a pretty common number across a good portion of South Texas. So tomorrow morning, we'll wake up to 77 and we'll have some morning clouds. The typical streaks of clouds in the morning, which will give way to nothing but sunshine in the afternoon. Right near 100 for the high temperature and a southeasterly breeze at 5 to 15. Same old, same old as we go through the weekend and into next week, right near 100 for highs. There is the slightest, most <laughs> off chance of a shower. 
Saturday afternoon. Don't get your hopes up. 10%. That, that's how desperate you are for yes. some sort of rain in the seven day. You've got, let's put this little bitty chance on Saturday. It's a stretch, but yeah, something. Yeah. Thank I, you, Adam. I appreciate the effort. When will we get back to normal? It's a question many are wondering amid this pandemic. Many believe the answer to that question is tied to a vaccine. This week's episode of our new digital program, Case That Explains, is all about the search for a COVID vaccine from what we know about clinical trials currently underway to the history of vaccines. RJ Marquez gives us a preview. It's something people have known for centuries. Some diseases never infect the same person twice thanks to immunity. Artificial immunity is the idea behind vaccines, and people have been trying to achieve it for hundreds of years. Some historians believe the Chinese inoculated themselves against smallpox as early as the year 1000 AD. But the founder of immunology in the West is considered to be Edward Jenner. In 1796, Jenner took pus from a cowpox sore on a milkmaid's hand and deliberately infected a young boy with it. Months later, he exposed the boy a number of times to smallpox, but the boy had developed an immunity and never got smallpox. Jenner's early methods went through medical changes over decades, but ultimately led to the elimination of smallpox in 1979. Louis Pasteur became the next major figure in the prevention of diseases and immunology. In 1885, Pasteur and Pierre Roux developed a rabies vaccine from infected rabbits. Pasteur spearheaded the early stages of a cholera vaccine in 1897 and an anthrax vaccine in 1904. A vaccine for plague was also invented in the late 19th century. The early 1930s was a significant time for vaccines, bringing about immunizations for diphtheria, typhoid, tetanus, tuberculosis, and whooping cough. And for the first time, vaccines were introduced for influenza and yellow fever from 1937 to 1939. Medical advancements throughout the 20th century have led to the creation of even more. American scientists William Hammond and Jonas Salk were responsible for the polio vaccine in 1952. From the 60s to 70s, we saw vaccines created for measles, mumps, chickenpox, and pneumonia. In the past 10 years alone, we have already seen vaccines created for malaria, dengue fever, and Ebola. Several diseases have been eliminated through the use of vaccines. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention calls them one of the greatest success stories in public health. RJ Marcus, KSAT 12 News. KSAT explains the search for a COVID-19 vaccine will be available to stream on demand tomorrow. You can watch it on the KSAT TV app, available on Roku, Fire Stick, and most other smart TV devices. A local startup capturing the attention of a major company. The robot's meant to help with a worldwide delivery service. Next on the Night Beat. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather. Streaming free on KSAT TV. Deliveries have become more of the norm amid this pandemic. More people are depending on getting their products shipped to them. This is in addition to the worldwide deliveries that were already happening before COVID-19. And as Max Massey reports, now a local startup at Tech Hub at Port San Antonio is becoming an instrumental part of helping FedEx. We've kind of gone from zero to almost 40 people here in the last three years. Paul Voss is a co-founder and chief operating officer of Plus One Robotics. We have developed some robots that help them. It's called induction. So we're inducting parcels onto a sorter at FedEx in Memphis. Voss and his team are now part of the core workflow of FedEx delivery services. These robots can automatically sort and move items ready to ship out. There are already four systems installed in Memphis. It's a time when automation really makes a lot of sense for hygienic reasons. And so I think all of us would appreciate it if uh, robots were handling our packages in instead of people. This system is fascinating and amazing how it can register all sorts of items, but it is not perfect. That's where people come in, basically robot managers. When people see robots, first thing that goes through their mind is we're putting people out of work. What this is doing is taking people out of jobs that people really shouldn't be doing and allowing those people to go on and do higher value jobs. Port San Antonio is a hidden technological and economic gem of San Antonio and of Texas. You see what Plus One Robotics is doing with artificial intelligence, supervised autonomy and sensors technology on robots. That's world changing type of stuff. Co-founder Eric Neves says a big reason for the company's rapid growth and success is simple. Our difference is our people. And 
our folks here in San Antonio are reliable, trustworthy, capable, curious, and think in terms of what is best for the person beside me. As for Plus One Robotics and other businesses here at Port San Antonio, the sky is the limit. These are the technologies that are driving our country. These are the technologies that are going to drive our economy for the next 100 years. Max Massey, KSAT 12 News. The honeymoon phase was extended in an unconventional way for one couple. Their journey back home, next on the Night Beat. All right, check this out. Three men lost for nearly three days while sailing, rescued after riding SOS in the sand. Australia's Defense Department says the men sailed off course, ran out of fuel, ended up on a tiny Pacific island. Their SOS sign spotted from above by a patrol vessel. Wow. Well, it started out as a regular honeymoon, turned into a four month long journey for a New Zealand couple left stranded due to the pandemic. The couple got married on leap day and spent two weeks honey honeymooning in the South Atlantic's Falkland Islands. But their flight out was canceled and they spent 12 weeks in lockdown. The Cliftons heard a New Zealand fishing boat was headed home, so they climbed aboard for a month long journey through the seas as they made their way back home. Wow. What a story. That is a story to tell right yeah. there. Hard to top that honeymoon. <laughs> GMSA at 430. Good night.